I'm, I'm not chairing out of any sort of, you know, ha having any kind of qualifications to particularly chair this session, but just because Sean asked me to. Um, I take the intention of this session, which I think is officially called philosophy slash science, um, to be uh, to discuss what role philosophy can play for scientists in pushing that forward and what role science can play for philosophers in terms of pushing their agenda forward. Um, I'd like to um, encourage a real open exchange, if we can have it, in the sense of less oppressing of pre-existing theses, you know, which has been interesting over the past couple of days, but really just an opportunity to see if we can really ask each other genuine uh, 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 sort of questions about what we could do really in the spirit of moving forward. You know, really, um, is there something that we can all walk away and ponder when we go back to our various labs, desks, in my case, couch. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm going to let Massimo introduce, really, in terms of content, something to give us to talk about. But I think we should feel free to um, riff as we like on this issue of what we can offer each other in terms of kind of split two different communities, you know, science and philosophy. What can we really offer each other, and, and will this dialogue continue when we leave? OK, Massimo. Right. So. Um I have a special interest, I, su I suspect. Uh, we all have an interest, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be here in, in the relationship between science and, and philosophy. Um, I think of my own as uh, perhaps a little more special than usual simply because I have this unusual uh, background, having been a practicing scientist and, a pra and now a practicing philosopher and having actually had um, gone to school for both cases. And so I, can, I, s I feel that I have a... a Maybe not unique, but certainly uh, unusual perspective in, in I mean, actually being a practitioner in both in both disciplines and see exactly where each side comes from, where when when they dismiss or criticize or make fun of the other. So I, I'm going to put up a few slides um, as a way to, to introduce the discussion. Um, of course, I think that everything that you're going to see in the next few minutes is going to be very uncontroversial, so we can pack five minutes after this and go home, but I'd be surprised if that's actually going to be the outcome. So, um, so you know, we're supposed to talk about science, philosophy, and, by the way, that little thing in the middle, scientism, um, uh, whatever that is. So we need to sort of agree on that one that is. Um, so first of all, I'd say that I'd suggest that we, we don't play uh, semantic games. Um, uh, and that when we talk about science and philosophy, we're talking about the academic disciplines as they're practiced. Um, so, you know, science cannot be taken to be just whatever deals with facts, just like philosophy cannot be um, whatever deals with thinking, because otherwise we're all scientists and philosophers and we haven't said anything particularly interesting, uh, I think. Um, so just to make more clear what I mean by that, the thing on the upper left is a scientific fact or a collection of scientific facts. The fact that I live uh, nearby the Queensborough Bridge is not a scientific fact, it's just a fact, okay? Um, so I take it scientific facts to be a subset of facts about the world uh, arrived at by the methods of science um, and by the community of science, not just simple observations about how the world works. Uh, similarly with philosophy, um, you know, uh, the one up on the upper left is actual philosophy, the one on the lower uh, right, it's not. Uh, and, you know, that's Ron Harbert uh, over yeah. there. Um, <laughs> God. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So again, you know, if we want to make a distinction. It's not like, oh, I, I got a philosophy and, and therefore I'm a philosopher. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, j just this morning, uh, I got as a, as a part of our Twitter feed that has been going on for the last few days, you know, somebody made the, the usual predictable um, uh, comment that, oh, but philosophy has gotten so technical and academic that it's essentially relevant to the rest of us. And my response to that is, yes, yeah, true, but that's true for any academic discipline. Most of what scientists do is irrelevant to the rest of us. Um, that's the nature of academia. Um, now, you can say that that's a good thing, a bad thing, or whatever. I think it's inevitable. Uh, but it's not, it's, I don't see why people sort of single out this one field as opposed to it and then let everybody else um, pass for, on, on that count. So, 
Science, in, in my view, becomes a particular type of structural social activity characterized by empirically driven hypothesis testing about the way the world works, peer review, technical journals, and so on and so forth. That's what I mean by science. I don't mean just getting up, on, uh, going out of the, you know, in the, in, in downstairs and say, oh, there is a road across the street. That's a fact, but it's not science. Similarly, I mean, the philosophy is broadly speaking about deploying logic and general tools of reasoning and argument to reflect on broad ranges of subject matters <coughs> like epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, and so on and so forth, as well as uh, to reflect on other disciplines. And these are the philosophies of. A lot of philosophy today is in fact a philosophy of. So there's, there's philosophy of physics, philosophy of biology, there's philosophy of chemistry, there's philosophy of language, there's philosophy of blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's sort of, you can think of that as sort of a meta-reflection on those disciplines. And of course, practitioners of those meta-reflections better be informed and respectful of those disciplines, which is not always the case. Uh, but those that are, are actually making interesting, I think, contributions. But contributions to what, you might say, no, I'll come up in a second. So another important point, I think, is, is to get straight, is that philosophy is not in the business of advancing science. <laughs> And there, we got science for that. And therefore, you know, um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I hear this accusation over and over, you know, what has philosophy done for us recently? Well, why do you think the philosophy is supposed to be doing something for you? Uh, it's not. It's a different discipline. It, it has different concerns, different methods, different, different all sorts of things. Now, some philosophy is, in fact, continuous with science. And those are the philosophies of science, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of physics. There are a certain number of papers, a, rather, a, a, a small one, however, in, in, the full, in, the, in the full area of philosophy. There is a number of papers where if you read them, you really wouldn't be able to tell whether they've been written by a scientist or a philosopher, a mathematician or a philosopher. And in fact, often they're written by both. Uh, there's a number of uh, philosophers who publish in mathematics or physics or biology journals and vice versa, a number of physicists and mathematicians and biologists who publish in philosophy journals. And those are really at interface. Uh, those are about conceptual clarification of borderline areas between science and philosophy. But that, I think, is a fairly small area. It's not the main concern of philosophy. It's not even the main concern of philosophy of. Um, then the question of, of how philosophy makes progress comes up. We think we all have an understanding of how science makes progress. Of course, there will be there are volumes written about that sort of stuff by philosophers, among other things, by social scientists, etc. But I think we can, in this group, we can assume that we know how science makes progress. Philosophy, I think, makes progress by a very different um, route. It's really, I think of it as an exploration of logical space. So you start with a certain problem. You, somebody comes up with a certain number of ideas. Then people sort of criticize those ideas. Then there is a response to those criticisms, and things move and become more complex and move away. Occasionally, positions are entirely abandoned, like logical positivism, for instance. Um, in other case, the debate is not resolved, but it has improved. For instance, the debate between scientific realism and scientific anti-realism in philosophy of science. Uh, it hasn't been settled, but there have been novel uh, positions, and there are certainly original positions that are not tenable anymore because of criticism. So it, I think that is a way in which um, one can make sense of the, of the idea that philosophy does make progress. Um, let me bring, bring up the bad boy of physics, uh, who famously said that philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. I think I agree. Now, there are different ways of cashing out that concept. Uh, the nasty uh, reply would be, well, that's because birds are too stupid to understand ornithology. But I won't go there. <laughs> um, it's true. And that's because ornithologists are concerned with different things from what birds are concerned with. So clearly, there is no, there's very little overlap. There's one area of overlap, interestingly, however. Uh, ornithology, one of the consequences of ornithology, of course, is that it provides information about rare birds and you know, things that are about to go extinct. And so those birds probably should be concerned with ornithology. <laughs> Uh, I'm not suggesting there is a direct analogy there, obviously, between philosophy and science. But I, I, I do think that that is the, that is the capture, this, this idea that, broadly speaking, the two disciplines are, in fact, separate. And then there are some areas of, of contact. Um, what about scientism? Well, there's much of definitions out there of scientism. I picked on two uh, that I think are sort of capture most of, the, of what's going on in that debate. In the strong sense, I think, uh, scientism is the view that only scientific claims or only questions that can be addressed by science are meaningful. Okay. Uh, 
so this, you can think of it as sort of the positivist version of, of scientism. In a weaker sense, or somewhat weakens, weaker sense, it is the view that methods of the natural sciences can and should be applied to any subject matter. Okay. Um, I think the first one is undefensible. I think the second one needs to be qualified, but I'm sure that we'll have some discussion about, yeah, about that. Question. I'm sorry? Qualified. It, I think the second one should be qualified, but we can, I, I can get on board on some, on, on, on some version of the second one. I think the first one is, is in fact, too strong. Um, for example, there's, I think there is a pretty good number of things where science has little or nothing to say about. Uh, I count math and logic in there. I understand that a lot of people think of math as a, as a science. I think that's not a tenable position because it's a very different kind of activity. It doesn't depend at all on empirical uh, information about the rest of the world. It's very relevant to science, so it's logic, uh, but they're def different disciplines. Um, certainly aesthetic, ethics, and so on and so forth. Now, aesthetics, that should be an S there. Um, now, even in aesthetics and ethics, I don't think the facts are irrelevant, nor do I think that scientific information of some stuff that deals with those things is irrelevant, which is why I would accept the second version, the weaker version of scientists. But largely, one can do aesthetics and ethics and logic and math without any input from science and just be fine uh, with it anyway. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, of course. Um, I would say that you can, the history of mathematics and logic are that there are discoveries. We discover something. We don't invent it. Um, I'm, I'm uh, on board with that. OK. There's something about the difference between discovery and sort of analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do see that as a put, putting math and logic somewhere in between, uh, that they're not really uh, a subject matter that's totally separate from science. It's yeah. a kind of science. Actually, I, I quite agree, Terry. And also, in, I mean, you can say, suppose as a physicist, I have a physical um, scenario in mind which forces me or other physicists, you know, largely string theorists these days, to make mathematical discoveries. Um, yeah. so, so it makes it a foggier, not just motivationally, but they're saying there is a physical reality, um, even if it's one I haven't yet probed experimentally, but I'm, you know, yeah. with forethought, assuming that this is going to constrain the kind of math yeah. I think that's um, an interesting to discover, discussion as to Terry have. said. Uh, I'd like to finish it, so calling one, oh, yeah, one or more, two more slides. And yeah, I, I think that's an interesting discussion Although, to have. as chair of the session, I'm allowing people to interrupt. Yeah, 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 no, that's fine. <laughs> um, the power is going to your head. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing she doesn't have a taser. Um, <laughs> I, actually. <laughs> but, but you're right that the, I certainly wouldn't go um, to the point of saying, you know, this, we, we've, we're generally, we've had this discussion in the past and I think we clarified ourselves. No, there's no territory that cannot be invaded by or, or talked by think the other side. If we're talking about intellectual issues, I think any competent, intelligent person ought to be able to talk about it. But that comes with a responsibility. Mm -hmm. So just like we expect rightly, philosophers to get the science correct when they're talking about science, and we chastise them if they don't, again, correctly, I think the same should be going for scientists. Well, it seems to be what happened. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes. <laughs> okay. So anyway, that was, those were just examples. Um, my general idea in all of this is, is, I guess I'm a little bit of old-fashioned from that perspective, because I think actually that this whole thing ought to be... Um, to look at as, uh, from the point of view of what used to be called uh, scientia, which is a Latin word for knowledge in the broader sense. Scientia, there was actually a journal called Scientia um, uh, when I was an undergraduate, um, and then it, it unfortunately closed down. There is no more knowledge in the broad sense. That's right, there's no more knowledge in the broad sense, which... <laughs> exactly, there's only technique. Um, and in knowledge in the broad sense there includes science, for sure, uh, philosophy, mathematics, and logic. That was sort of the broader realm of, of and, and these things are not seen as completely separate fields. They're seen as largely looking at different things in different ways, but they're sort of supposed to interact with each other and to, to giving us, give us sort of knowledge in the broad sense. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to say goodbye to everyone. I enjoyed visiting with you all. It was fun. Thanks. Thank you. Um, now, I also think that... <laughs> That knowledge is more a uh, narrow uh, concept than understanding. And human beings seek understanding, not just knowledge. And I'm, I'm trying to broaden a distinction here that will bring, therefore, in things like 
music, literature, and the broader humanities, because those, I think, as Rebecca was saying uh, just yesterday, are necessary for an understanding, because we're human beings. We think in a certain way. We don't, we don't just think in terms of equations. We don't just think in terms of logic. Uh, we understand things in a broad, in a, using a broad swath of, of approaches which include those things. I'm not saying that therefore we should be doing you know, novel, novelized version of quantum physics, um, but I'm saying that it's, if we're talking about scientism as, oh, this is the only way to know and to understand things, um, that's not gonna hold. And finally, uh, let me remind you this quote by Isaac Asimov, anti-intellectualism has been a constant winding, uh, uh, thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. I mean, this is our common enemy in the United States. There's a very good uh, tradition in sociology of, of actually um, tracking different types of anti-intellectualism in the United States. I think we're all concerned with these kind of things. And I think we don't do any, any good service to the cause of fighting anti-intellectualism when we start finding about your stuff is you know, nonsense, that one is, is idiotic, and so on and so forth. In fact, I would go as far as saying that any broad claim like that is itself anti-intellectual and, and feeds into these sort of things that, um, that is problematic in American society. So that's it. That's, that's what I wanted to say.